So in magnetic confinement, we use another force of nature, which is the electromagnetic force. Um, and that's very, it's orders and orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force. And the key force that matters here is that if you have a charged particle, that namely it's a particle that has an electric, net electric charge, and it's in the proximity of a magnetic field, then there is a force which is exerted on that particle. So it's called the Lorentz force for those who are keeping track. So that is the force that we use to replace physical containment. So in so this again, so how do you hold something at a hundred million degrees? It's impossible in a physical container. This is not like you know, it's not this plastic bottle holding in this liquid or a, a gas chamber. What you're doing is you're using a, you're immersing the fuel in a magnetic field that it basically exerts a force at a distance. This comes back again to, again, like why plasmas are so yeah. strange. It's the same thing here. And if it's immersed in this magnetic field, you're not actually physically touching it, but you're making a force go onto it. So that's the, and that's the inherent um, feature of, of, of magnetic confinement. And then magnetic confinement devices are like a tokamak are basically uh, configurations which exploit the features of that magnetic containment. There's several features to it. One is that the stronger the strength of the magnetic field, the stronger the force. And for this reason is that if you increase the strength of magnetic fields, this means that the containment, because namely the force which you're pushing against it is more effective. Uh, and the other feature is that there is no force so for those who remember magnetic fields, what are these things? They're, they're also invisible. <laughs> but, you know, if you think of a permanent magnets or your fridge magnet, there are, there are field lines, which we actually designate as arrows, which are going around. You sometimes see this in school when you have the, you know, the iron filings on a thing and you see the directions of the magnetic field lines. Or, or when you use a compass, right? So that's telling you north because we, we're living in, a, in an immersed magnetic field made by the Earth which is at very low intensity magnetic, but it's strong enough that we can actually see what direction it is. So this is the arrow that the, the magnetic field is pointing. It's always pointing north, and for us, is that, so an interesting feature of this force is that there is no force along the direction of the magnetic field. Hmm. There's only force in the directions orthogonal to the magnetic field. So this, by, by the way, is a huge deal in, 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 in a whole other discipline of plasma physics, which is like the, the study of like our near atmosphere. So the study of aurora borealis, what's happening in the near atmosphere, what happens when solar flares hit the magnetic field. In fact, remember I said fusion is the reason that life is responsible in the universe? Well, you could also argue so is magnetic confinement because the, the charged particles which are being emitted from from the galaxy and from our own star would be very, very damaging to uh, on Earth. So we get two layers of protection. One is the atmosphere itself, but the other one is the magnetic field which just surrounds the Earth and basically traps these charged particles so they can't get away. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same deal. How do you create a strong magnetic field? Yeah. So with a giant magnet. Giant magnet. Yeah. <laughs> so it's is basically true. Engineering is there's awesome. essentially there's essentially two ways to create a, a magnet. So one of them is that we're familiar with, like fridge magnets and so forth. These are so-called permanent magnets, and what it means is that within these, the atoms arrange in a particular way that it produces the electrons basically ar arrange in a particular way that it produces a permanent magnetic field that is set by the material. So those tend those have a fundamental limitation how strong they can be, and they also tend to have this. Like circular shape like this, so we don't use we don't typically use those. So what we use are so-called electromagnets. Mm -hmm. And what is this? It's like um, so the other way to make a magnetic field. Also go back to your you know your 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 elementary school physics uh, or science class is that you take a, a a nail and you wrap a copper wire around it and connect it to a battery. Then it can pick up iron filings. This is an electromagnet. Mm -hmm. At its simplest, what it is, it's an electric current which is going in a, in a pattern around and around and around. And what this does is it produces a magnetic field which goes through it by the laws of electromagnetism. So that's what an electro that's how, so that's how we make the magnetic field in these in, in these configurations. And the key there is that you it's not limited by the magnetic property of the material. The magnetic field uh, amplitude is set by the amount of the, the geometry of this thing and the amount of electric current that you're putting through. And the more electric, electric current that you put through, the more magnetic field that you get. The closest one that people maybe see is uh, <laughs> one of my... <laughs>
<laughs> one of my favorite skits actually was Super Dave Osborne on you probably it's probably it's probably past you. It was like in a show called Bizarre. Super Dave Osborne, which was a great comedian called he was a stunt man and one of his tricks was that he was he gets into a car and then one of those things in the junkyard comes down, you know, and picks up the car and then puts it into the into the crusher. Mm-hmm. This is his stunt, which is pretty hilarious. Anyway, um, but that thing that picks him up. Like, how does that work? That's actually not a permanent magnet. It's, a, it's an electromagnet. Mm-hmm. And so you can turn, by turning off and on the power supply, it turns off and on the magnetic field. So this means you can pick it up and then when you switch it off, the magnetic field goes away and the car drops. Okay, so that's that's what it looks like. Speaking of giant magnets, MIT and Commonwealth Fusion Systems, CFS, yeah. built a very large high temperature superconducting electromagnet that was ramped up to a field strength of 20 Tesla, the most powerful magnetic field of its kind ever created on Earth. Um, because I enjoy this kind of thing. Can you please tell me about this magnet? Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, it was, it's fun, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to parse there. So maybe, uh, we. so we already explained an electromagnet, which in general is what you do is you take electric current and you force it to, 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 to follow a pattern of some kind, typically like a circular pattern, around and around and around and around. It goes, and the more time, the more current and the more times it goes around, the stronger the magnetic field that you make. Okay. And as I pointed out, it's like really important in magnetic confinement because it is the, the force that's produced by that magnet. In fact, technically it goes like the magnetic field squared because it, it's a pressure which is actually being exerted on the plasma to keep it contained. Uh, just just so we know for magnetic confinement, what is usually the geometry of the magnet? What are we, what the are we geometry, supposed to imagine? Right, yeah, so the geometry is typically that typically is what you do is you want to produce a magnetic field that loops back on itself. Mm-hmm. And the reason for this was goes down to the nature of the force that I described, which is that there's no there's no containment or force along the direction of the magnetic field. Right. So here's a magnetic field. In fact, what it, what it's more technically or more graphically what it's doing is that when the when the plasma is here, here's plasma particles here. Here's a magnetic field. What it does is it forces all those because of this the, this Lorentz force. It makes all of those charged particles execute circular orbits around the magnetic field, mm-hmm. and they go around like this. But they stream freely along the magnetic field line. So this is why the nature of the containment is that if you can get that circle smaller and smaller, it stays further away from Earth mm-hmm. temperature materials. That's why the confinement gets better. But the problem is, is that because it free streams along, so if we just have a long straight magnetic field, okay, it'll just keep leaking out the ends like really fast. So you get rid of the ends. So you basically loop it back around. So what these look like are typically donut shaped or t- more technically toroidal shaped, but d- donut shaped um, things where this collection of magnetic fields loops back on itself. And it also, for reasons which are more complicated to explain, basically it also twists that also twists slowly around in this direction as well too. So that's what it l- looks like. That's what the plasma looks like because that's what the fuel looks like. So then this means is that the um, the electromagnets are configured in such a way that it produces the desired ma- magnetic fields so around this. So they, how precise does this have to be? You were probably listening to our conversation with some of my colleagues yesterday. Mm-hmm. So it's actually it's it depends on the configuration uh, about how you're doing it. The configuration and the, of the plasma. The sorry. configuration of the electromagnets and about how you're achieving this this requirement. Um, it, it, it's it's fairly precise, but it doesn't have to be in uh, particularly in something like a tokamak. What we do is we produce planar coils, which just mean they're flat. Mm-hmm. Um, and we situate them. So if you th- think of a circle like this, what does it produce? If you put current through it, it, p- it produces a magnetic field, which goes through the circle like this. So if you align many of them like this, 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 there's things online. You can go see the picture. Duh, duh, duh. You keep arranging these around in a circle itself. Mm-hmm. This forces the magnetic field lines to basically just keep executing around like this. So you tend to align... That one tends to, re- well, it requires in- in good confine or good alignment. It's not like in- insane alignment because you're you're actually exploiting the symmetry of the situation to to help it. There's another kind of configuration of magnetic of this kind of magnetic confinement called a stellarator, which is a, 
we have these names for, for historic reasons. Which is um, different than a tokamak. It's different than a tokamak, but actually works on the same physical principle that namely, in the end, it produces a plasma which loops in magnetic fields, which loop back on themselves. Well, but in that, in that case, the totality, basically the totality of the confining magnetic field is produced by external three-dimensional magnets. So they're twisted. Um, and it turns out the precision of those is 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 more stringent yeah so are, are tokamaks by far more popular uh, for research and development currently than stellarators of the concepts which are there the tokamak is by far the most mature in terms of its breadth of performance and um and thinking about how it would be applied in a fusion energy system. And the history of this was that many, in fact, you, you asked, what well, if we go back to the history of the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, so the history of fusion is that people, scientists had started to work on this in the 1950s. It was all hush-hush and, you know, Cold War and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's like, they realized, holy cow, this is, like, this is like really hard. Like, we actually don't really know, like, what we're doing <laughs> in this because everything was at low temperatures. They couldn't get confinement. It was interesting. And then they, they, they declassified it. And this is one of the few places that the, the West and the Soviet Union actually collaborated on was a science. Even of this. during the Cold War. Even during the middle of the Cold War. It was really, and this actually yeah. perpetuates all the way to now for, we, we, we can talk about the, the project that that is sort of captured in now. Um, uh, but, and, and, and the reason they declassified it was because like everything, like, kind of like sucked basically you know uh, about trying to make this confinement and high temperature plasma and then the russians uh, then the soviets right came along with this device called a tokamak which is a russian acronym which basically means uh, magnetic coils arranged in the shape of a donut <laughs> mm -hmm. and and um they said <laughs> holy holy cow like everyone was stuck at like a meager, like half a million degrees or half a million degrees, which is like in fusion terms of zero, basically. Um, and then they come along and they say, oh, we've actually achieved a temperature 20 times higher than everybody else. And it's actually started to make fusion reactions. And everyone just go, oh, you know, no way. It's just hype from this. It's like, there, there's no way because we, we failed at this. Um it's a great story in the history of fusion is that then, but they insisted, they said, no, look, you can see this from our data. It's like, this thing is really hot and it seems to be working. This is, you know, late 1960s. And there was a, uh, there was a team that went from the United Kingdom's fusion development lab and they brought this very fancy, amazing new technology called a laser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they used this laser and they shot the laser beam like through the plasma and by looking at the scattered light that came from the, they go, that basically the scattered light gets more broadened in its spectrum if it gets hotter. So you could you could exactly tell the temperature of this, and even though you're not physically touching the plasma, it's like, holy cow, you're right. It is like, <laughs> it is 10 million degrees. And so this was one of those explosions of like, everyone in the world then wanted to build a tokamak because... It was clearly like, wow, this is like so far ahead of everything else that we tried before. Um, so that actually has a part of the the story to MIT and the Plasma Science and Fusion Center was, wh wh why is there a strong fusion and a major fusion program at MIT? It was because we were host to the Francis Bitter Magnet Laboratory, which is also the National High Field Magnet Laboratory. Well, you can see where this goes, right? From this, you know, we're kind of telling the stories backwards almost, but, you know, the 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 advent of a tokamak, um, along with the fact that you could make very strong magnetic fields with the technology that had been developed at that laboratory, that was the origins of sort of pushing together the physics of the of the plasma containment and the magnet technology and put them together in a way that I would say is, you know, a very typical MIT success story, right? We don't do just just pure science or pure technology, we sort of set up this intersection between them. And there were several pioneers that of of my of the of people at MIT, like Bruno Coppi, who's a professor in the physics department, and Ron Parker, who was a professor in electrical engineering and nuclear engineering. It's like even the makeup of the people, right, has got this blends of science and engineering in them. And that's actually was the origin of the Plasma Science and Fusion Center was was doing those things. So anyway, so back to this. So why so yes, tokamaks have been have achieved the highest in magnetic fusion by far, like the the the, the best amounts of these of these conditions that I, that I talked about, and in fact pushed right up to the point where they were near QP of one. 
Mm-hmm. They just didn't quite get over one. So can we actually just linger on the uh, on the collaboration across different nations? Just um, yeah, maybe looking at the philosophical aspect of this. Even in, in the Cold War, there's something hopeful to me besides the energy that these giant international projects are a really powerful way to ease some of the geopolitical tension, even military conflict across nations. There's a war in Ukraine and Russia. There's a brewing tension and conflict with China. Mm -hmm. Just the world is still um, seeking military conflict, cold or hot. Uh, what can you say about sort of the lessons of the 20th century and these giant projects uh, yeah. in their ability to ease some of this tension? So it's 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 a great question. So as I said, there was a reason because it was so hard. That was one of the reasons they they, they declassified it, um, and actually they started working t- together in some sense on it as well too. And I think it was really there was you know an heuristic or or altruistic um aspect to this it's like this is something that could change you know the future of humanity and its nature and its relationship with energy isn't this something that we should work on together mm-hmm. right and, and 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 that went along in those ones and in particularly that any kind of place where you can actually have an open exchange of 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 people who are sort of at the intellectual frontiers of your society, this is a good thing, right? Of being able to collaborate. I've I've had the, I mean, I've have have had an amazing you know career. I've worked with people from. It's like hard to throw a dart at a country and, and on the map and not hit a country of people that I've been able to work with. How amazing is, is that? And and even just getting small numbers of people to bridge the cultural. And societal, societal, uh, um, you know, divides is a very important thing. Even when it's a very I mean, teeny fraction of the overall populations, it can be held up as as an example of that. But it's interesting that if you look at then that continued collaboration, which continues to this day, is that it was it, this actually played a major role, in fact, in East-West relations or like so Soviet-West relations. Is that um, back in the uh, the Reagan Gorbachev days, which of course were interesting in themselves of all kinds of changes happening, you know, on both sides, right? Um, and but still, like a desire to you know push down the the stockpile of nuclear weapons and all that. Within that context, there was um, a very fairly significant historic event that at one of the the, the Reagan Gorbachev summits. Is that they had really they did they, they didn't get there like they couldn't figure out how to bargain to the point of the of the, of the some some part of the treaty I can't even remember the details of it anymore, but they needed some kind of a symbol, <laughs> almost to say, but we're still going to keep working you know towards something that's important for all of us. What did they pick? A fusion project, and that was in the mid nineteen eighties, um, and actually then after so. They basically signed an agreement that they would move forward to like literally collaborate on a, on a project whose idea would be to show large net energy gain in fusion's commercial viability and work together on that. And very soon after that, Japan joined, as did the European Union. And now um, uh, that project, it, it evolved over a long period of time and had some interesting political ramifications to it. But in the end, this actually also had South Korea, India, and China join as well too. So you're talking about make major, a major fraction of, and, and now Russia, of course, instead of the Soviet Union. Um, and actually that coalition is holding together despite the obvious political, you know, uh, turmoil that's going around on all those things. And that's a project called ITER, which is in under construction in the south of France right now. <laughs> 